so my uh, journey using CLR techniques really started at the beginning of this year after I saw a couple of different presentations that were using these techniques and I thought that they did a very effective job at addressing a number of issues that are really challenging in education. One of those issues is student engagement and the disproportionate engagement uh, of different groups, different cultures. Um, it's not necessarily an ability gap or a, a difference in intelligences, it's simply how do you engage everybody and it's a task that teachers are often asked to do but not necessarily often told how to do or at least how to do it effectively and by using a number of these different techniques I was just finding that the engagement in my classrooms was going up it was asking students to do more talking which means that they're doing more learning it's getting them up and out of their seats which they enjoy but is also a, a valid way to get them to interact with each other to learn from each other and it sets up a, a really nice framework for ways that you can run discussions that you can review material or you can ask them to think about new material and that guidance I found to be very very helpful in getting these students to the point where they're at today which is um, you know a fairly uh, advanced lesson about uh, fairly advanced in the content that they have to know about proteins I mean proteins are kind of a an esoteric topic, but I was trying to use CLR to get them to think about the, the real kind of nitty-gritty issues of something that they maybe don't really ever think about outside of class. Okay. Awesome. Show yourself some love. Well done, man. That was good. I'm just going to give you the way that you could reflect and sort of redirect your thinking if you happened to vote the wrong way on this one. These do happen to have correct and incorrect answers, so don't, don't beat yourself up over it, but maybe if you voted the other way, take this as an opportunity to rethink why you thought that answer originally. Does this only happen to enzymes? No, it happens to proteins. Enzymes are some of those, but it can actually happen to, look ahead, there are two things that can cause denaturation. Uh, Shout them out. What are they? Temperature, temperature and pH. Temperature and pH. Awesome. That's where we're going with this next one. Uh, if everybody could grab one sticky note off of their table, hopefully you've got something to write with. You can get that out if you don't. We're going to have a, a campfire discussion. We practiced this yesterday. It's a way of sort of organizing the discussion that we're about to have regarding these two factors. So we've established temperature and pH, those are both ways that you can cause denaturing of proteins. On your sheet of paper, I would like for you to take a shot at explaining why it is that changing temperature or changing pH, feel, feel free to pick one of them, it affects some levels of protein structure, but not all of them. Why? Why is it that changing temperature only affects some of those levels and not others. Uh, I've got a couple ways you could frame your statement or you could get your statement started up here. Uh, maybe you say a certain level of structure is not affected by temperature or pH because. Uh, maybe you talk about a type of bond that is affected or is not affected, again, because of temperature and pH. Maybe you say a certain level of structure is affected but another one is not. And you talk about the difference between those two levels of structure. There's a few different ways that you could approach the answer to this question. I'm going to give you 90 seconds right now to make a statement, to come up with your best answer. This could be a sentence or two. Let's keep it quiet for folks to think. 90 seconds. Go ahead. Who starts it? Uh, the person at your table who is physically furthest away from me. That's how we'll start here. The furthest away from me right now, you're going to go first. To recap what we're going to be doing, we'll go around clock, counterclockwise, just go to your right. I would like for you to put down your sticky note on the campfire and share what it says. What was your answer to this? You go around, everybody shares their answer. 
The second time you go around, you are reflecting or responding to one of the statements that's already on the campfire. Maybe you have a question about it, maybe you'd like to clarify it, maybe you agree or you disagree, but I'd like you to discuss one of the ideas that has been presented. We'll go around twice. Please indicate to me, when you are done, when you've gone around twice, show me that your group has finished by creating a little bit of thunder, having a little earthquake on the tables, all right? Go ahead, start the campfire discussion. So for an answer here, and uh, to do this, I'll just pick a number, tables one through seven. Let me know when to stop. All right, Ben. Uh, ben, what did you have as your explanation for why some levels are affected but not others? Okay, so I said. That primary level of structure is not affected by temperature or pH because the covalent slash peptide bonds in primary structure are too strong to be broken by the increased motion and or uh, bond interference that is caused by temperature and pH. Woo! Um, but We're going to do kind of a version of musical chairs here. And your job is to stop when the music stops, but no chairs. You're actually not going to sit back down. You're going to stay standing. Because this whiteboard, there should be two at each table, each whiteboard is two chairs. So two people per whiteboard. You want to pair up at a whiteboard. As you are walking around, please make your way up here. Grab a single marker per person. I will pass out the erasers to the different tables. You don't need to bring anything with you. You simply need to move until the music stops and then pair up at whiteboard. So if everybody can see you. <laughs> or a whiteboard, I should say, actually doesn't matter. With your partner, if you could divide the whiteboard down the middle to wide way so you have two roughly equal sections. Here's the goal, here's the, the task that I'm going to give you. I want you to draw at the same time, but you are not allowed to speak or communicate as you are drawing. In one of those sides, I would like you to both draw the graph and the line on the graph that represents denaturing due to temperature. After you finish that one, go to the other quadrant and do the same thing, but a graph of pH as caused by denaturation. Again, this should be silent. You should not be verbally communicating with each other. Show them to everybody. See if yours agree with theirs. What are you looking like? What are we doing here? Okay. Alright, good stuff. So, hopefully your graphs look something like this. And I'll just do a quick extension here. I wonder if you labeled your axes. If you don't have a silent appointment, you can put your hand down when you have found one. Waiting for all folks to have one. Pew, pew, pew. Oh. <laughs> all right, hey. So, how you would annotate these graphs, or I'll put that another way. How do you explain the shape that that line on the graph makes? And you want to done. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, so I have one temperature for like, each and then optimal level, like what it is. Everybody clap your hands. It's always a mystery how long that one's going to go on. Yeah. We got, for, uh, no, we got it that right Forever. All right, uh, so I'm looking for a couple answers from a couple people. I'll just call out some names, uh, and we'll, we'll start with temperature. That's the one I'd like to show up first. What did you have to say to explain why the graph is shaped the way it is for temperature? Uh, go ahead, tell me what's up. Nick, we'll finish up today real quickly with a, uh, a coral read. We'll, we'll all read the highlighted words out loud together. As temperature rises, there is an exponential increase in enzyme activity as a result of increased Um I think that what went well was the students were in a place where they were 
processing the information that we've been looking at in class in some new ways. And in my assessment of it, they were doing that successfully. Yes. The, the sort of, the, the car that we took to drive to that destination were a lot of these CLR activities. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say, and that, in that way, the lesson was successful because I, I did want them to expand the ways that they were sort of thinking of this information away from rote memorization. I ask this question, they know what the answer is supposed to be. So, so sort of reframing things for them. I would say that as far as things that could go better or things that could be improved, um, I know that my transitions could be a little tighter. Yeah. I, I try to get them to do things, you know, on my go but I know that sometimes they'll just sort of sneak past that, they'll start a little early, or they won't necessarily use that as sort of the, you know, the, the gun that starts the race off. Always working towards uh, engagement versus compliance. Right. Doing everything I asked, but I know that I can always get more students genuinely engaged in the content. There were a few students who weren't necessarily finding partners immediately, so we had to shuffle that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so isolated instances across the classroom where students were maybe left out, left behind, or, or I could have done a better job of keeping them sort of in the game at that moment. Right.